please welcome Gary Belsky. So her name was Jenny, and she was a 22-year-old intern just out of college at the St. Louis Business Journal, where I was a cub reporter. And from the moment I met her, probably in early June, I was smitten. She was awesome. She was kind of like a young Winona writer before she went crazy. <laughs> and uh, we, she liked me too, I think, because we started spending a lot of time together. But all of our dates, or all of our time together, never ended the way I wanted it to, which was romantically. And I was a little bit uh, timid. I had grown up uh, in an Orthodox Jewish household and spent a lot of time in yeshivas and rabbinical seminaries. And so I didn't really have a lot of moves. Or as I like to think about it, I was profoundly respectful of a woman's right to initiate. And, um, but we kept hanging out. And it's good that I didn't initiate, because about a month into that summer, I happened to walk by her desk. And she was scribbling feverishly on a, on a yellow legal pad. And uh, she explained to me that she was writing a letter, this was 1986, to her best friend from college. A, a few hours later, I was sitting at my desk, and she came by to say, to, to say goodbye because she was leaving for the day. And at that moment, the editor-in-chief of the magazine came to her and asked her a question. So she turned away. And I realized that the legal pad she was holding was at eye level. And being a very good reporter, I started to read it. <laughs> and it didn't take me long to get to me. And in it, she described me as a guy she really liked, she was hanging out a lot with, but she didn't want to touch. And right then she turned around. And she didn't know I was reading her legal pad, but I was pretty much comatose from that moment on and really just kind of wanted to go home and go to bed. And we said goodbye, and I got over it the next day. And we kept hanging out for probably another month or two. We were both going to be leaving for, for good. I was going to be moving to New York to come work for Crane's New York business, and she was going to be traveling the world for a year, maybe two. Towards the end of the summer, um, we were spending every weekend together. We were spending many nights a week together. She seemed to like me more, but again, I was very respectful of a woman's right to initiate. And uh, on a Thursday before a weekend when we had plans for Sunday, I said, what do you want to do on Sunday? And she was like, well, I was thinking that we should go skydiving. And I did what most people do when somebody says I was thinking of going skydiving, which is say, oh, I always wanted to go skydiving too. What I didn't say was, I have a, but I never have because I'm terrifically afraid of heights. Like, I can't get on a ladder. <laughs> I also didn't think, like, nobody says that and actually means it, but the next day Jenny came in and said, guess what, I made reservations for us at a skydiving place in Sparta, Illinois, which is about an hour and a half outside of St. Louis. And I was like, great. And we hung out that weekend, Saturday night, too. We actually wrote, she had an idea to write our last wills and testaments and mail them to ourselves. In case, <laughs> if things worked out fine, we could just get them. If they didn't, we'd be able to sort of leave word to the, our loved ones. And she thought that was a great idea. I was just getting progressively terrified. But the next morning, Sunday morning, I was at her house at 7 o'clock, and we drove in my Isuzu all the way uh, to, out to Sparta, Illinois. And we got to the place about 9 o'clock, about 8.30 for a 9 o'clock uh, beginning. And we were going to basically, the, the way it would work was we were doing what was called a solo static line jump, which is you were going to jump out of the plane by yourself, but your parachute, this is 1986, but your parachute was going to be tethered by a static line to the plane, so it would, it would pull it for you. The idea was, we learned, that you jump out of the plane, you'd feel nothing for a second, then you'd feel a giant pull, which was good, because that meant your chute had deployed, and then a pop, which was also good, because that meant the static line had broken away from the parachute, and then you'd glide nicely down onto the ground. <laughs> anyway, the class started at 9 o'clock. <laughs> the class started at the, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. The class started at 9 o'clock, <laughs> And for about an hour, we were treated to visuals of what it would look like after we jumped when we raised our heads. Ideally, by the way, what you want to see is a rectangular piece of cloth filled with air. <laughs> that was the first thing I understood. But so, for example, if you saw nothing, that would be bad. If you saw, like, fabric bunched together like a beach ball, also very bad. And over the course of the hour, they explained to you what to do in all these different situations. We broke, then came back gave us the same hour with a different instructor. Broke, came back the same hour with a diff another instructor. Five hours, five different instructors, the same course. Now, everybody else was getting impatient, including Jenny, because they really wanted to get out there and jump from that plane. I was delirious with our deep dive into um, parachute theory, because I didn't really want to jump at all. I was terrified, but I didn't want to let Jenny know that. Anyway, after about 2, 2.30, we went out and we, we watched our shoots being packed. Normally, you want to pack your own shoot, but the first time is you don't know what you're doing, but you want to sort of own it. And you want to watch them packing your shoot because it's very important that, they, that the folds go back and forth. And then we did a short course on the, uh, the drop and roll, which is what you do with a round parachute. 
which they don't know, which they stopped using in the 70s, a rectangular chute allows you to grab toggles about 100 feet above the air and pull on them very quickly, and all of a sudden you are able to glide down and you land like this. But you need to know how to drop and roll because in case the main chute doesn't open, you will have an emergency chute, and the emergency chute is round. Now, the good news, they explained, was that if you fainted because your main chute didn't open, <laughs> there was an explosive charge tied, tied to your chute, and the explosive char charge was tied to an altimeter, so if you were falling at a certain speed below a certain altitude, your chute would, ex uh, the, 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 a charge would explode and the main, the emergency parachute would open. So while you would land, awkwardly, you'd be alive. Maybe break, break a few bones. Everybody else seemed to get great uh, comfort from this, but the idea that, <laughs> the idea that I could be falling unconscious and then have something explode on my chest, to me was terrifying. Um, but we got into the plane, it was a Cessna four-seater, and the back seat was taken out. There was a pilot, there was the jump master, and there was the four of us, I was last one in. That was significant. Because when we got to 3,000 feet, can I get some water? I think I have a glass there. <laughs> because when we got to 3,000 feet, I basically gave up the ghost of trying to pretend that, that I really wanted to skydive, and I said, I don't think I can do this. I have a terrific fear of heights. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jenny said, um, you didn't tell me that. And I was thinking, there's a lot I haven't told you. Uh, but the guy, I'm sure, had seen this before, the jump master. He said, well, that's fine. You don't have to jump. But you're the last one in, and you need to be the first one out, because we can't start shuffling around, because the chutes have to be very, you know, they have to be pristine and tightly packed. I don't know if this is true or not, but he said, we would have to land, we would be in the back of the queue of the other airplanes, and your friends might not be able to jump. Now, he clearly recognized that while I'm a coward, I'm a team playing coward. <laughs> and I was like, okay, fine. So I jump, and the jump goes as follows. When you're doing a, a, a static line solo jump, you, the, you open up the fuselage door at 3,000 feet, traveling 70 miles per hour, and you, you hang your leg. I'm very good in a crisis in general, so I was able to do this. You hang your legs, over the side, and you affix your static line to the plane. Then you look at the, you look at the jump master and you go like this, because it's very loud. And he goes like this, and that means you're ready. And then you lean forward and you grab the strut that connects the plane wing to the plane fuselage. It's like a bar like this. And the idea is you grab it, you swing yourself down, you look back at the jump master, and you count to three and then let go. <laughs> now, time, they now know, uh, is a function of how much information you're absorbing. And so these three, <laughs> The next few seconds, uh, I remember very clearly because they, it felt like they went for a long time. But I, I leaned forward, I grabbed the strut, I let myself go, I looked back to the instructor and we started counting. We went one, and I remember thinking, why am I outside of the plane? <laughs> but in kind of an evil biological way, like you just, it wasn't like a rational thought, it was just like, I'm in a plane, I'm supposed to be inside of it, not outside of it. <laughs> Two, I remember thinking, why are they having us count to three? I can barely hold on now. And three, I fell. And I fell back. It felt like a few seconds. I think that's what it was. And then all of a sudden, I felt a really big jerk. And I was like, that's good. My chute is deployed. And then I felt a pop. And I was like, that's good. My parachute and my static line have separated. And then I started twisting around like a corkscrew. Now, we had walkie-talkies affixed to us that had two-way communication. I don't remember any of this, and I really don't remember much of what happened later, but it was recounted to me by the people on the ground who apparently were talking to me, and I was talking to them, but I didn't know it. And essentially, after I realized that we were corkscrewing, I looked up and said out loud, oh, left end cell closure. I need to take my right hand, pull down the middle, of the, uh, the middle left rope back towards my right ear, which I did. And it popped open the left side of my chute, which had, cl which had been tangled, which is why I had I was spinning around like that. And then I said, again out loud, oh, so that's why they had us do that class five times. <laughs> I don't remember that. But when I landed, that, <laughs> when I landed, that was recounted to me. And then they, the guy walked up, ran over to me, the tr truck sort of picks you up and takes you back to the jump center. And one of the guys goes, dude, you had chute failure and you crushed it. <laughs> and I was like, and I, but of course, Jenny doesn't see it, because she's in the plane. She hasn't jumped yet. So they tell her about it, and she's like, oh, that's good, because like, well, she jumped, and it was fine, and I jumped, and it was fine. 
We go to the parking lot, and she had brought a t-shirt for the ride back home, and she takes off her shirt, and she's just there in a bra, and I was like, well, that's interesting. And then we went home, and we had drinks, and she invited me up to her place, but I didn't go because I was tired and I was late, and she doesn't want to touch me in my head, which is what I think. And at this point, I am taking respect for a woman's right to initiate to, like, Antioch College levels. <laughs> Uh, I never jumped again, but I did see Jenny. I left a couple weeks later to go to New York, and she left to go around the world, but we kept in touch. She would send me postcards and once in a while call me, and she said, you want to meet me in Japan? This is about September of 1987. I was like, sure. And I went to Japan, and we spent two and a half weeks together hitchhiking around the country. Uh, still never touched her because I was just sort of madly in love with her and terrified. On the last night, she'd give me a present. And the present was uh, the book The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which was her favorite book, and she wanted me to have it. And it's a short book, and so she goes, you should read it to me. And so I read it to her. It took about two hours. And by the end of the two hours, she had basically was sidled up to me so close that I don't think I could have moved my head without kissing her, which I did. And she seemed to like touching me at that point. And the next morning, we woke up, we were having breakfast, and she said, well, last night was interesting, which is not necessarily what you want to hear from somebody after pining for them for 15 months. But she explained that she was surprised because she had been interested in me for a while, but had thought that I wasn't interested in her. And what I told her was, well, you know, sometimes your feelings for people change. But of course, what I should have said was, well, sometimes your feelings about yourself change. Because a year after I had the guts to jump out of a plane for Jenny Petzal, I had the nerve to jump out of a plane for Jenny Petzal. Thank you.